Yeah, so this is our podcast. We are Creatures of the Night. I am Wendy. And I am Chris. Thank you for joining us today, tonight, tomorrow, whenever you're listening to us. Exactly. Ah, oh, so how are you, Wendy? How you doing? You know, just just making it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought you were going to say something in Spanish for a second there. Like, oh, oh man. No, I was trying to get my oldest to teach us Spanish words today. Funny that uh. you mentioned that because I took French in high school. So we were having him say all these words. And I know this is going to make me sound like an awful mom, but I wanted to know if he knew some curse words in Spanish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, do you know my favorite word in Spanish? And he's like, I'm not going to say it. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sitting here telling you it's okay to say. I want to know how to say it. And then he goes, no. And I was like, because you think I'm going to catch you in the house cursing in Spanish? I'm like, Uh. I don't ever catch you going around speaking in Spanish in the house. So (laughs) pretty sure I'm not going to hear that. Yeah. Well, now... Now he can't because now if you hear him like dropping some Spanish words, you're like, oh, that's got to be one of the cuss words that I enjoy. Now, if I can just get him to tell me which one of them, then that would be great. That's funny. So I got something funny to tell you, uh, too. It's not about Spanish, but my husband was up first thing this morning downstairs on the couch watching fishing videos because that's his life now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Are these like the cool fishing videos that like, I don't know, it's probably still on TV, but like on ESPN 5 or something, there's oh. like some guy out, you know, fishing, catching big fish, and they always saying crazy shit, and they're pulling up these giant sea monsters. And yeah. is it like he's watching those kind of fishing videos? Or are they like instructional? No, some, so half and half. So what's funny is actually one of the guys that he watches, I swear to God, when I saw him watching this, I was like, is that Johnny Hauser? And my husband's like, who? And I, and I, so obviously not. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, you remember when I, I went to the Velisca Axe murder house and I told you there was that guy there who was super nice. That was Johnny Hauser. The dude that's fishing looks just like Johnny Hauser. But so whenever I see him, I'm like, that's my boy right there. He's going to catch all the fish because that's really Johnny Hauser. I guarantee it. <laughs> So no, I I don't even know if he was watching a good one. I came downstairs. He has to tell me the story. He says he got up at the ass crack of dawn because like I said, his his whole life revolves around fishing now. So he does that like every morning he gets up super ass early and he's usually not even here. He is gown. So he's home. He's watching videos. I come downstairs and he's like, I got to tell you this. It's really funny. I'm sitting here on the couch and I'm watching videos and I hear someone coming down the stairs. So his back is to the stairs. And he's like, oh, he's thinking it's me. And he even says that in his mind. Oh, Chris must have, I must have woke her up. And now she's coming downstairs to see what the hell I'm doing. So he hears someone coming down. He doesn't see anybody walk past him. And he's like, the fuck? And then all of a sudden on the floor, he sees my fat cat meandering. (laughs) (laughs) I said, I said, I told you. And so he laughs at me. He's like, I know you've said that before about Pandora. And I said, look, I even had to warn Wendy's kids when they were over because one of them slept downstairs. And I said, look, 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 I know you've heard all the stories about my my home being haunted. It is. But when you hear something coming down the stairs that sounds like it's a person, it's my beast of a cat, not a ghost. (laughs) I thought that's where you were going. I was like, oh, my God, this has happened. Your husband has had a paranormal experience. Oh. This is the best. We're going to write this date down in history. Nope, oh. it's the fat cat. Wendy, I wouldn't have even been able to hold it for the podcast for you. I probably would have <laughs> taken pictures first thing in the morning just to commemorate of his face. <laughs> Record it. Say it again. <laughs> I know. Right. Say it one more time for me, please. I so wish it wasn't the cat. I wish I wish so much that the ghost in the house had actually been like, you know what? <laughs> It's time this motherfucker knows what's up. <laughs> nope. He says, it was your uh, football playing beast of a cat coming through. <laughs> the defensive like line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the funny thing is, like, she's got, like, a kind of a weird, raspy, but high-pitched meow. Mm-hmm. So, of course, she turns and looks at him, and she's like, ah? <laughs> and he's like, the fuck you, cat? <laughs> and she's like, and you're up. So why don't you feed me now? (laughs) I need more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I thought that was funny. Not a ghost this time, just a cat. 
but maybe maybe for future. I mean, he is getting up really early. The only problem is, is that he's getting up and he's piecing out of the house. He's not sticking around to see if anything's going on. Yeah, and I'm sure if it's really distant sound, he's writing it off as somebody must be up or whatever. So he's not like going to actively investigate it. No. But funny that you mentioned it. Speaking of cats and possible paranormal activity, I don't know. It was just me. Well, I mean, the kids were in bed and then I'm in bed by myself. The cat's not with me yet. And I hear the cabinet door, like a cabinet door from my kitchen or from a bathroom or something. And it was really quick as if she could have pawed at it and it just opened and then shut immediately. And But I thought, is she strong enough to do that? (laughs) And also, why would she be doing that? Right. So I, well, I inquired everybody else's opinion to this. <laughs> well, is a cat strong enough? We couldn't get Winter to reenact it for us. Yeah, right, right. She wasn't down for it. She was actually quite annoyed that we were trying to force her to do things. Um, <laughs> so Dance, I, monkey, dance. <laughs> I thought it was very odd. Now, she's in there always making all kinds of fucking noises before yeah. she'll come to bed. But I thought, that's really strange. <laughs> Well, we used to have a door in our house, and it it wouldn't quite catch the latch completely. Right. It would be shut enough, but apparently the cat the cat could open up the door. She would put her paw underneath the door, and she'd pull it open. Yeah. It was the bathroom. Because this is – Pandora used to always be my, my buddy, and for whatever reason, my cat uh, bathroom buddy as well. Uh, I don't really know why. I don't know what's so <laughs> special about being in the bathroom with me, but she sure does enjoy it. So, and then after a time of sitting in there with me, <laughs> sorry for airing all of this out for you guys listening. Oh my God. I mean, I'm sure a million people have this thing. All right. three of my animals must all come into the bathroom I mean, with me. If I shut the door, they're there scratching at it and pawing yeah. at it for me to open it. Yes, yes. So, well, that's the thing. So she'll go and sit by the door when she gets tired of sitting in there with me and she'll open it. That was the door that wouldn't always be closed all the way, which should have been since it's the bathroom. But, you know, whatever. She just opens it and she leaves. Now the door's halfway open for the whole world to see me sitting in there. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, thanks so much, you evil, evil cat. Well, because we have like a toilet closet, you know, so it's within the bathroom. But, (laughs) you know, sometimes I'll leave it open because I know they're all going to come in there. And then then I hear kids kids coming around the corner speaking to me and I have to be like the bathroom store's open <laughs> <laughs> don't don't come in there right there because there's, there's a mirror right on the other side of it oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like they'll be able to see me from I don't know how right. it really works I've never s- tested it out with anybody like, <laughs> halt do not come any further <laughs> I'm like the door's open and they're like oh, why gosh. is that door open because the animals must watch me pee. (laughs) We're a weird house. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good. Then hopefully everyone understands, everyone with pets anyways, that that's just how they are. They just, you know, you got to have them in there with you. So I have an oops to mention. I also have an update. Um, Which would you like me to spill the beans on first? So I'm excited about the update. Definitely want to hear that. I like getting bad news out of the way first and then then feeling good with the good news. So do the oops first. Sweet, because I I actually put them in that same order because that's how I (laughs) want it to. (laughs) So, okay. On today's oops corner... I did realize on one of our past episodes, it was called a cozy little demon infested living room. I misspoke and incorrectly said uh, one of the girl's names from that episode wrong. The first girl that I mentioned, I believe I called her Anne-Marie Shabert. I believe I said it like a thousand times. I don't know. Maybe (laughs) maybe there was something about Bert. I mean, I always like Bert and Ernie. I love Sesame Street. So maybe I was just like, we're going to retype this and now she's Shabert. So... Unfortunately, I didn't have a haunted Bert and Ernie story, but I tried to squeeze it in, I guess, with Shaybert. But her name was not Anne Marie Shaybert. It was Anne Marie Shaburl. Like Shaburl, probably it was a German name, so I'm sure I'm even still butchering it. But just wanted to point out there was no T on her name, it was an L. And I'm sorry about that. Anyone that was listening who was screaming at the top of their lungs because they already knew the story, I apologize. There it is. That's my oops. I'm sure there will be dozens of others <laughs> as a matter of fact this whole episode is probably full of them that i'll have to clarify later on now for my update on another episode that we had it was 46 i think it was called speaking of hot dogs i don't have any for you but i have murder <laughs> <laughs> 
I said that I really wish I had known where on Apple Door that Karen Christensen had worked. And apparently, Karen Christensen had worked for Celia Thaxter. And I know this because after the murders on Smutty Nose, Celia wrote about it. How I missed this in my research, guys, I don't know. <laughs> I guess because I'm so that good. disappointing. <laughs> I did. I, I failed on my research, but I was so shocked because, like I said, you know, I, I just remember having that thought. I wonder because if she worked on Apple Door, where of all the places could she have worked? Well, she worked at the damn hotel. And I was so excited because that meant to me that Karen possibly might have seen the ghost of Philip Babb and even more possibly the Laka Waka. <laughs> and. <laughs> At this point, I'm really just looking for any excuse to just say that on my podcast. So I'm just going to squeeze that in every just chance. Keep I keep bringing it up. Yeah. Don't forget, guys. Laka Waka. Laka Waka. I mean, right. you got to put it in front of it, but you know what I mean. I like that. So check this out. According to poet Celia Layton Thaxter, Karen had been working for the Thaxters at their tourist hotel on Appledore Island for two and a half years. Oh, wow. I know, right? This is like, this was just amazing to me. And through a twist of fate, she was fired by Celia Thaxter's mother, Eliza, just two weeks before her murder. According to a letter by Cedric Layton dated February 23rd, 1873, the mother, Eliza Layton, had shouted at Karen, depart and never come my way again. Damn, what did she do? <laughs> Well, that's so funny. That's actually what I was telling my husband. It, they seemed to think that she was uh, too, like, meek, I guess, too frail, I guess, to be doing housework. They were actually like, yeah, sewing is actually more your speed. You can sit down somewhere and sew. Oh, they're, so they're like, man, this bitch is slow as hell. Yeah. <laughs> Probably she's probably like clumsy and breaking stuff and everything too. Possible. I mean, I am. I mean, when I do housework, I'm breaking things all the time. Like, look, I was I vacuumed as a matter of fact before I got started, and I'm yanking that stupid cord. It's like <laughs> the size of a, a football field, and yet somehow it manages to get wrapped up in a ball like a um, like a cat ball of yarn. And I'm yanking and yanking. Meanwhile, I'm ripping off the cards I've got taped to the post there. <laughs> Like, just pulling them all off. I mean, I, like, thanks. That's what I needed to do. But anyway, so I don't know if that was her deal. I guess they didn't have corded vacuum cleaners back then, so probably not. But yes. That's a bummer. <laughs> oh, right. Karen left the Leightons and returned to stay with her family on Smutty Nose. Interestingly, in the house that the haunt vents were renting from the Leightons. Oh. Right? I mean, it's just like twist and turns. I didn't even know that. It's kind of a small set of people. So you, oh, would, yeah. you would assume that they're all kind of connected. I mean, it's like a small town, except yeah. it's broken up on islands. Right. But yeah. <laughs> Take a boat to get across. Right. In a letter to a friend the week after the murder, Celia wrote, Karen was quite one of the family here. It was she of whom I wrote the little spinning ballad, you know. <laughs> no, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Now I'm afraid these dear people will all be frightened away from here and no more will come. That's so funny, though. They fucking fired her. <laughs> and and then they're like, she was a sweetheart. We oh, loved yeah. her. We fired her and sent her to her family's house. And now she's fucking murdered. Like, yeah. she could have been safe here in our big hotel or whatever. Yeah. She also speculated, which... This was one of those things where it was disproven based even on the story that I told you was was based on some of the things that they had brought to light during the guy's trial, whatever, John, something. <laughs> I can't think of his name now. Al. <laughs> but Celia. You could have just said the guy's trial. Just leave it. You know. You Go know. back and listen to the that episode. Guy. That episode. Remember? <laughs> so she speculated that he was there to rob her of her pay, her pen penance from working on Apple door, which like I, I told you, he was actually after the haunt vents money from right. their fishing business. Yeah. But I mean, he's there for all of it and anything yeah. he could find. Right. All I got was like 15 bucks. Right. But that's yeah. a silly statement. I know <laughs> he's there for financial gain, no matter who it came from. 
Right, exactly. Well, she was uh, she was an interesting gal, though. She said things like most of like the stories that she had written that involved Norwegian women would basically came from. Karen and her sister. She thought that they were they were beautiful people. Their fair skin tone, their blue eyes, things of that nature. So whenever, if you ever happen upon one of those spinning ballads, as Celia so put it, just think if if she's talking about a woman that most likely she was referring to Karen Christensen. So there you go. See, that's a juicy story. I thought you were going to tell me is that she got uh, fired. Some kind of scandal. No, she's just that a been terrible great. maid. <laughs> she's a terrible maid. And remember, this is the one that came to live with her sister because she was broken hearted. So it would have been nice and juicy had she found her a hot date on Apple Door and she just couldn't keep her little hands to herself or something like that. But no, no, no. She just sucked at cleaning, apparently. You know, like, because she probably fucking hated it. <laughs> she's like, you know what? This kind of sucks. So, anyways, that was my update. So, I do actually have an interesting story for you. Would you like to hear a new one or do you want to keep talking about past episodes? <laughs> I want to hear a new one. Okay, cool. Uh, I got to tell you with this one, I fell in love with the story the moment I read it. And like it was one of those, I was about to actually post this on Twitter. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the whole world needs to see this. And uh, now that I know what I know, I, I really should have just posted it on Twitter. At the time I read it, I just couldn't. I decided that I wanted to research it more and share it on the podcast. I should have posted it and just walked away, but I didn't. And today, my dear friends and fellow listeners, what I'm going to tell you about is a little story from Hong Kong. Ooh. (laughs) That's what I said, too, right? These days, the areas that I'm going to tell you about are just like any other place. You know, on one hand, you've got a bustling business district crammed with skyscrapers, luxury hotels, and exciting nightlife. On the other hand, you have a touristy, hip, little laid-back college town. You've got the best of both worlds here on this peninsula and roughly within about 20 to 30 minutes from each other, depending on traffic, I suppose. Ooh, don't you think their traffic's terrible? I bet it's horrible. (laughs) Yeah. So, and to be fair, I did actually uh, Google map this a couple different times during the day (laughs) to see if it would change. (laughs) So I I figured that it was going to be terrible or it would be like suggesting that I walk. And I never saw that. It was always like, yeah, 20 minutes this way, 22 minutes this way. Yeah, it depends. But two minutes traffic, I guess I could handle. So I don't know. Maybe many people aren't driving. Maybe more are walking. I don't know this for a fact or something, but I saw a post one time that in the Asian culture, they're more polite, I guess would be, I don't really know what's the word, but you know, everybody stays on one side to go the in one direction and the other side to go in the other direction. And I think it's just more respectful of people's space. Yeah, Somewhat. maybe. But I've also yeah. seen those videos of where they're trying to cram onto the subway <laughs> and they're definitely not being <laughs> respectful. You know, I don't know. I have seen I have seen a lot of videos. I've seen one about like a um, some kind of a buffet, and it seems like there's no order when it comes to buffets. I think that's more of like the get out of my way, elbow drop. That's mine, you know. <laughs> when it comes to that sort of thing, so I don't know. I guess it just depends. Traffic, a okay buffet. It's a fight for your life. Watch yourself. Got Watch it. Yourself. Okay. So. <laughs> So this wasn't always such a cool place. In fact, on December 8th, 1941, Japan launched an invasion on Hong Kong, which is known as the Battle of Hong Kong, which was the first of the battles of the Pacific War in World War II. On the same morning as the attack on Pearl Harbor, forces of the Empire of Japan attacked the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. The attack was in violation of international law as Japan had not declared war against the British Empire. The Hong Kong garrison consisted of British, Indian, and Canadian units as well as Chinese soldiers and conscripts from both within and outside of Hong Kong. Sorry, I totally lost my my spot. (laughs) I had to say that really long. Turn this light on. Maybe that'll help me out. Stanley Village was one of the last battlefields on the defense. The Royal Rifles of Canada, many elements of the Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps, and sections from the middle sex were all stationed there. Fighting occurred in the Colonial Military Cemetery itself, and the British eventually surrendered on Christmas Day of the same year. 
During the 44-month Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, the Murray House in central Hong Kong was used as the command center by the Japanese military police. While under the Japanese, the building was witness to horrible atrocities of torture and murder, which would end up claiming the lives of more than 4,000 Hong Kong citizens. Shit. And these are just citizens. Like, they're not soldiers or anything. No. After World War II, several government departures moved into the Murray House, which was used for offices of official business. Look, I'm going to tell you right now. It might be Murray. It might be Murray. I'm just going to mix it up. That way there's no more oops corner. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you pronounced it wrong. Nope. I, I nope. pronounced I, it both I, ways. Gonna They're mix it up. out. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to come back and be like, no, those R's are silent. Damn it. <laughs> So anyways, they used the offices in the building now for official government business. In 1965, the Rating and Valuation Department also moved in, making this one big happy government family. Until they started hearing and seeing weird shit. (laughs) (laughs) Why wouldn't that bring them together even more as a family? Well, you would think so. I guess in, mo- in most respects, it did, because a lot of the people that were also inside the building agreed on all of the weird shit. So it did bring them closer as a family unit. Many of the government employees reported that active spirits prowled the premises. So they sought out permission from the government to perform an exorcism through Taoist rituals. That was the mic drop. That was the whole world needs to know this. I'm like, e- are you serious? <laughs> And they got permission because the government there, I guess in Hong Kong, was like, yep, I don't need to fuck around with that shit. Let's just go ahead and and exercise this. (laughs) They did. (laughs) Members of the rating and valuation department, which were the newbies, basically, to the Murray House, now located in the former Murray Barracks Officers Mess Building, they told the China Post, and I quote, on a number of occasions, drawings and blueprints had been laid out to dry, but were later found to have been smeared or modified by additional marks and signs. The former officer's mess at the junction of Garden Road and Queens Road East is haunted. So is the former HMS Tamar building, which was a short distance to the east. All reported to the South China Morning Post on May 5th, 1963. Also among the reports was the complaint that equipment in rooms in the western part of the building would break down or refuse to function without any explainable reason. At times, some of the staff heard unaccountable noises from the section of the building and also soft, weird sounds, which could not be explained. What does that mean? (laughs) I don't know, but I love that description. Soft, weird sounds. So I don't know if it was like a... Ooh, you know, like some kind of spooky because I wouldn't be like, what the hell? You know, uh, I don't have, you know, monkeys or whatever. Just kind of. I just find it interesting that they didn't try to like describe it in any certain way. Like say it sounds like a monkey or it sounds like a lady crying or they're just it's just fucking weird. OK, <laughs> there's so much going on. It's very soft, so it doesn't seem aggressive. I don't yeah, know. Right. Right. They're just like it's soft. Weird. Shouldn't be there. Look, I'm just here doing my job, typing away, doing what I need to do. And then all of a sudden I keep hearing, (laughs) just get rid of it so I can do my job. Otherwise... (laughs) <laughs> that's what it is that's what it sounds like that they didn't take the time like we would to be like what does it sound yeah. like let's right. record it let's play it back let's yeah. enhance it let's see what it's saying they're just yeah. like what the fuck is that weird sound? could you make that stop right i'd be like this quote this can wait <laughs> they also noticed shadows being cast by invisible subjects that Ta-da! sounds so much fun (laughs) it does doesn't it i wonder if the invisible subjects were the ones that were responsible for making the soft weird sounds well i mean what else would you attribute it to (laughs) it could be something else but i think you would connect it if you're seeing this kind of phenomenon 
And then there's this sound phenomenon. You're going to assume that they're coming from like, oh, that must be that. Unless it didn't come in that direction. It's on the, yeah, on opposite sides. So you're like, wow, we got a lot going on here. But that, can you imagine just sitting at your desk and you look up and there's just shadows on the wall and there's nobody that could be doing it? And you're just like, (laughs) is anybody else seeing this? You're right. I would probably think at that point, since I'm at work, I'm already stressed out that I would have lost it. That that was it for Chris. She's lost her marbles. Not thinking in the ghost hunter mindset like, okay, do I need to sage this place or could it help spice things up a bit? You know, <laughs> I might stay on a little longer now that I know it's haunted. Hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now you have a purpose for being there. <laughs> A puppy came to visit me. A puppy came to visit me. Oh, what are you doing? Look at this doggy. Look at doggy. She wants to be in the podcast. Mm-hmm. All you got to do is bark. Everybody knows you. She smells so good because she's all clean and bathed and stuff. She loves you even after you cut her hair. Oh, I bought her a new bed today too. Oh, well, see. You're buying her affections. <laughs> I know. It's because I love her the most. Yes, I do. My cats don't like me anymore, so I got to buddy up with the dog now, right? Oh, um. <laughs> This is not exactly goes along with what you're saying, but it's hilarious. Last night, I'm drinking my little seltzer alcohol drink, and I'm like just putting it up to my lips, and Rose is right here. (laughs) Her nose, her mouth, she's just right here. That's so cute. And as I open my mouth to drink from it, she licks my lip a little. And I'm like, because I let her inch close to me to see how far she would take it. And then eventually she's like, since you're, <laughs> since you're open, can I have a drink too? And I'm like, Rose, stop it. That's so funny. Have you ever given her alcohol before? No, I've never given them uh, alcohol, but we feed them all the time. So yeah, I told you before, Alexa used to be my, my that's wine buddy. Right. right. You did. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if that's why she was really over here. She's like, Hey, hook us up. <laughs> I know you're in that corner. You must be drinking my stuff. <laughs> Not anymore, Alexi. Too many calories in wine. Sorry, dog. Uh, all right. So. And by the way, I I don't give her that much. I would let her finish off like the dribble that was in the bottom of my wine glass. I wasn't like pouring me a glass and then pouring her a glass too. Like, (laughs) oh, I'm not drinking up. (laughs) Got a whole bottle. (laughs) I did admit that to the doctor and the doctor said, don't do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Um, At the former HMS Tamar building, then occupied by the administrative office of Radio Hong Kong, One staff member claimed to have been in the bathroom when he felt a tugging at his sleeve, and then suddenly the air became uncomfortably warm. (laughs) I'm just like, (laughs) okay, so if you're peeing, you're like, okay, I'm done, forget it. But like, if you're in the middle of something else, (laughs) it's like, do I stay in here to finish? (laughs) No, I know. That is so funny. This was personally not one of my favorite claims. Uh, I have to say anything that happens in the bathroom that is not number one or number two is a personal horror story to me. (laughs) Don't touch me. Don't change the temperature. Just wait until I'm done. And then haunt me all you want, guys. Just not in the bathroom. I have serious business to take care of in there. Leave me alone. (laughs) This is not the time. I feel so bad for the person who had to come forward with that story. <laughs> <laughs> what if he's just making excuses for why, why he was in the bathroom so long? Oh, that's so funny. I love that. I didn't even think about that. They're like, Look where at- have you been? It's been 10 minutes. <laughs> and stay and out of like- it for probably 10 more minutes, just in case he's not done he's with like, talking on don't sleep. understand. This was happening. <laughs> right. I couldn't leave. They wouldn't let grandson. me. They wouldn't He's let me. He's in there I on like his that. fucking phone. <laughs> <laughs> Checking the latest stats, whatever. Playing Overwatch or whatever they do on yeah. their cell phone. I don't know. Um, on May 19th, exorcism ceremonies were carried out at the Murray House by 90 Buddhist monks in a 10-hour ritual designed to pacify the ghosts. Serious business. Fucking serious. 10 out. Is it like because the building is huge? Are their ceremonies must be way longer than a Catholic priest? Because I've seen that <laughs> shit on TV and it's over right? with in like 20 minutes. Yeah. They've got their incense and their holy water. They're doing this and they that. They scream and it's like, at it and sprinkle some shit around and then they are yeah, done. Let's go get pizza. Take it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> it feels lighter in here already, right? All right. Let's go. <laughs> no, you're right. 
these these guys took it serious. And the building, back to what you're asking, yeah, it is actually a pretty big building. I don't think it's a 10-hour long ritual, you know, size building. I think that, that that's just how serious they take it. Well, the monks will be playing around with that I shit. I appreciate that. I do too. I think maybe we need some more of that uh, kind of action here in the States, you know? <laughs> Instead of those, like you said, those Catholic priests that are like, all right, well, I'm going to do my best and hopefully we can. Uh... Well, I don't know. I say that, but there, there's more to the story. So I guess let me finish before I start speculating. <laughs> I, I love to go off. Before top. we start telling them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you need it. Oh, wait, there's more to the story. Wait, wait. <laughs> I did actually write this. I know that there's some more. So <laughs> before I start questioning things. So before midnight, Tablets bearing the names of those known to have died through calamity or atrocities on the site were taken outside and burned in a furnace. Wait, this was a part of the exercise? Yeah. I mean, look, I don't know anything about Taoist rituals, but apparently that's their way of moving on unrested spirits. Okay. I, I can't argue it. I don't know anything about it. That's, I mean, I know here... From the movies and shows that I've seen, usually if, if you've got a spirit that's attached to something, taking it outside and burning it, it doesn't work the same way. Usually doesn't appreciate that, but like, <laughs> they mean business over there. They mean business, right. Maybe they did something else. I, I even hope that I'm saying Taoist right. I, I hope so. Um. <laughs> you know I'm not an expert, but I feel like I've heard that before, and I think you are saying it right. But I cool. really don't know. You know, I think it's all in the intent. So if if that fire ritual is held very sacred to them and they have the right intent with it, then it, it doesn't really matter whether they're burying it, burning it, sending it off in sea, whatever. Right. I'm sure it was some kind of respectful release. It's no, all, you're right. Yeah. With all jokes aside, I think where I come from, where I say uh, on the shows and the, the movies that I've seen, generally it's, it's some kind of a, a negative energy or demonic energy that they're taking to burn. This was a symbolic, like you said, it was a way of releasing those spirits from being trapped in a place of, of such horror and moving them on. So I, I do think it was actually a good thing. It was just kind of it was weird hearing it in that sense. They were just like, yeah, all their names, we just burn it. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's usually not associated necessarily with good burning yeah. stuff, but I'm, I mean, they know best. Right. I left it in their hands. It seems like they did a good job. <laughs> I'm glad I hired them. <laughs> <laughs> On June 7th, the Post reported that the building's employees no longer complained of ghostly goings on. However, other stories I've read suggest otherwise. Apparently, there have been recent reported sightings of a headless ghost which roams the bathrooms. What the fuck? Get out of there. <laughs> I'm busy in here. Why the bathrooms? I don't know. That's interesting, though. They seem to be fond of that area. And uh, other reportings are the sounds of typing which can also be heard in the dead of night. So if you're snooping around this building, which is, is very open, you should be able to walk past it and hear what sounds like typing just throughout the walls. Uh, excuse me, coming out of the building, not throughout the wall, unless you're like, hello, is anybody in there? <laughs> That's creepier. To yeah, me. I know. <laughs> like there's little to... mice in there with little typewriters. Little typewriters? <laughs> well, I wonder if that had anything to do, like maybe the, uh, what did I say earlier? The soft sounds? Yeah. Maybe they could make it out before, but maybe the soft sounds were actually just typing noises. I don't know, because they, we don't have a description. I type very violently. So Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I could never type softly, ever. No. So unless it actually is mice typing on a little yeah. typewriter, then <laughs> it's not soft, probably. Look, I even have an adding machine at my desk, and I punch those. Oh, <laughs> you have to. <laughs> I, but it's like I, I was telling uh, the girl that I work with that it's like sometimes I use it as my punching bag because I'm taking out oh. my frustration. And that bam, bam. Yeah, I, I type pretty hard, too. Yeah. You, well, I have a fondness for breaking phones. We talked about that before. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my phone always gets it. <laughs> right. Um, now, one other point of interest to the story that I need to mention is that the Murray House, which now stands in Stanley, Hong Kong, was originally constructed in the present day business district of Central in 1844. This is where it was used as the officer's quarters of the Murray Barracks. In 1932, the historical landmark was dismantled in order to build the new Bank of China Tower. 
Over 3,000 building blocks or stones were labeled and cataloged so that the building could later be restored. I wonder about the effect that that might have had on, you know, any lingering spirits, considering, you know, that there are recent stories about the building. Like, what if the exorcisms didn't really remedy all of the unrested spirits and they felt like it might be better just to, let's just take it down, guys. Let's just... Brick by brick. Let's just take it all down and pack it up nice and neat. I don't know. Again, I'm speculating because that's what I like to do. (laughs) I just, I am always fascinated by this idea. You hear it many times in history, not today really at all. People just demolish stuff and rebuild somewhere else. It's very rare to be like, I'm going to take this down, piece, 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 Mm -hmm. piece, or just move, like how they just move houses on those big trucks or whatever and then relocate them because they want to use the space for something else now but they're not going to get rid of this house or like when you told the story of the Isles of Shoals and they just packed up their houses and put them in boats and stuff Yep, board by board they threw them in them but yeah they did the same thing they're just maybe they just label label piece by piece like it's a Lego set or something like that or you're building some Ikea furniture I don't know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's just so cool to me that they're reusing materials like this. Yeah. I wish we saw more of that today, but I guess a lot of the yeah. stuff that people build today is not really no. built that way. It's all welded no. together and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to tell me, but I just, I'm so fascinated when this happens because we've talked about this before. Where do the spirits go? They right. are connected to the stones of this building and go to the new location. Or did they right. hang out some hung out in the new building? You keep going because I know you, okay. I'm sure you have more. I got some weird stuff for you. So basically what ended up happening is that the housing department proposed the resurrection of the building in Stanley, Hong Kong, which did eventually happen. They restored it and it officially reopened in 2002, which is just 22 minutes away from where it originally sat. Uh, If you're driving, again, I don't know about walking. Uh, (laughs) But there was a small problem with the rebuild. Apparently, a few of the markings on those stones had actually gotten rubbed off during the move. So it had to be put back kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah, like, let's see if this piece fits. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Not so much. Let's try that one. After (laughs) It's kind of silly, though. It it almost sounds like they didn't have an actual architect like helping them with this. It was like, you bitches on your own. We numbered all the shit for you. And then, like, oh, no, I rubbed off. (laughs) We don't know where it goes. Like if they had somebody that was skilled in this, they'd be like, no, that doesn't go there. Structurally, to make it sound, it must go here. Right. So funny that they're just like trying to figure it out on their own. (laughs) That's the funny thing. Like when I first read that story too, I'm like, the fuck were they using chalk? I mean, like it rubbed off. I mean, clearly it's stone. So, I mean, chisel a number or something into it. Like how? No, that would take too long. But it's just, Apparently. So, it's just so funny. That's that... what they were thinking. They're, they just took like a lead pencil and they're like, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just got, yeah, it got rubbed off. I thought that was funny. After shortly housing the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, it's now home to restaurants and shops and has a lovely view of the sea. Originally, the Murray House was classified as a grade one building. The rebuilt house was not graded because the relocation project had ultimately failed to meet the international standard for heritage preservation. I'm guessing that had something to do with all of those missing or mislabeled stones. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> they, they fucked themselves. <laughs> well, they still recycled, so that's good. They did. They did still recycle it, but you're right. Uh, I also questioned the integrity of the building. Uh, I did see it. I looked at it, and it looks like a lovely place. I mean, it's been standing for quite some time now, and, you know, I guess, so I guess it's okay. But it's super open, like I said. It looks like they have, like, a this whole veranda style where, like, the whole up, upper floor is open. It just has these beautiful, like, red or maybe orange curtains kind of flowing you know, it makes it look very coastal. And like I said, this was the hipster area anyways. So it looks like a place to chill and have a maybe, I don't know, a martini or something and, and watch the sea. Just have, a, you know, a time. I don't know. It, it looks nice. Sorry. I was just having a flashback of when I actually tried a martini and I was like, that shit's <gasps> gross. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the thing I posted on Twitter? That's so funny that you said that. Hold on. I got to tell no, you No, I didn't see it. Funny. I posted this a couple days ago when I was like, 
I was so frustrated at work that I was starting to see red. It says, how to make the perfect martini. One, pour gin, vermouth, and olives into the trash where they belong. Two, drink <laughs> <laughs> no drink what i'm sorry i laughed over drink it whiskey <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> i'm with the person that made that it was so funny i was like that is my life the only martini i've ever had that was any good was like a caramel apple martini and you like drench caramel syrup like all around the rim and stuff so it was more of like a sugar-based drink than anything so oh. there was no olives in that one <laughs> <laughs> so what makes this story even more interesting is that they moved the building to stanley a building that had already seen so much horror and violence now it's literally minutes away from the colonial military cemetery where the battle took place on christmas day and St. Joseph's College, which had yet another very horrendous moment in history involving a massacre. It's actually referred to as the St. Stephen's College Massacre. So going back before the British surrendered on Christmas Day, Japanese soldiers entered St. Stephen's College, which was being used as a hospital. It was on the front line at the time. The Japanese were met by two doctors, Black and Whitney, they were marched away and were later found dead and mutilated. Ooh. They then burst into the wards and bayoneted. Is that even how you say it? Yes. Bayonet? Why do I have well, to not say with it that like- southern twang <laughs> on it? <laughs> twang. Bayoneted? Is yes. that how you say it? Yes. Okay. Bayoneted a number of British, Canadian, and Indian wounded soldiers who were incapable of hiding. The survivors and the nurses were imprisoned in two rooms upstairs. Later, a second wave of Japanese troops arrived after the fighting had moved further south away from the school. They removed two Canadians from one of the rooms and mutilated and killed them outside. Why are they even... I, okay. Yeah. Why are they taking the time to mutilate them for one thing? It's just fucking Hor- rude. It's horrible. <laughs> it is so bad. Many of the nurses next door were then dragged off to be tormented. I actually took out what they did to them just to save us from thinking about it. We can use our imagination. And then they mutilated them too. I've watched a lot of Mindhunter this week, so I I got it. Yeah. I got to catch up like really bad. I'm watching Dark Crystal, so. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) When Mindhunter ended, I was told, you know, this has started. (laughs) It's like, this is a big thing in my house right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. It's awesome. And not to sidetrack from the story, but if you've seen the movie, The Dark Crystal, then you have to see this series. It's beautiful. Now, don't get too close. And Wendy, I might even recommend taking your glasses off so that the um, the speech not really mirroring up with them moving their mouths won't seem so weird. <laughs> it's kind of blurry. It's like, oh, yeah, everything looks looks about right now. That's good. It's good. I like it. Where was I? Oh, yeah. The following morning after the surrender, the Japanese ordered that all of the bodies should be cremated just outside the hall. Other soldiers who had died in the defense of Stanley were burned along with those killed in the massacre, making well over 100 people altogether. During the Japanese occupation, Stanley Jail and Village were used as a prisoner of war and civilian internment camp, and the cemetery, which had not been used for more than 70 years, was reopened for burials from the camp. Although the cemetery as a whole is laid out and maintained as a military cemetery, in the older part, service graves and the graves of civilian internees who died during the Japanese occupation are intermingled. A number of the graves in this part of the cemetery are still marked by the original headstones erected by the prisoners of war who collected the granite from the 19th century fortifications and carved the inscriptions themselves. I cannot wait to post some of the pictures of these because it's wild just to see that and to know that they carved them themselves, you know, by hand. It looks like it if you're looking at it, but you're like, is that new? Are we doing that for effect? Nope. That was legit. That's it's really insane stuff. I just think it's amazing that they took the time to do all that. Well, I mean, I guess I don't know if they had any other like option. I just mean that they're under occupation. I'm sure it's a very traumatic, horrible time. And yeah. then, you know, they're trying to honor those that they lost. It's right. really beautiful to make the it effort is. to still honor those people instead of just, I mean, I would just, you know me, I just like freeze up in fear. It's 
Like, I know. I don't know how know. helpful I would be. I know. Yeah, it's it's very emotional. You can you can just imagine it, you know. And like I said, when I see when I show those pictures when I post them, I think it, it kind of comes through just the emotion and everything. There are now 598 Commonwealth servicemen of the Second World War buried or commemorated in the cemetery. 175 of the burials are unidentified, but a number of special memorials commemorate casualties known to be buried among them. The cemetery also contains the new Hong Kong Memorial, which commemorates by name Chinese casualties of the two world wars who have no known graves. Mm. So there was a lot of brutality uh, happening right there in Stanley. So it's possible that some of the activity being reported in the Murray House now could have maybe lingered from when the building had originally been reported as haunted, sure, or maybe some of the spirits from the massacre have found their way there. I don't know. Maybe it's just easier to report that that location is haunted because it was a confirmed incident, like the government recognized it, that sort of thing. So maybe that's why the there's not as much going on in these other places because I, I wasn't able to really find a whole lot of anything, as a matter of fact, paranormal related to the St. Stephen's College or the cemetery. S- well, okay, I say that, but there was one exception. I read the story that a gentleman had wrote. I don't have his name because, again, I'm a terrible researcher. So let's just say, <laughs> let's call him Al. <laughs> I was going to say you're like a, a C plus student. I mean, you just <laughs> got the name wrong. Like. <laughs> But I don't know. <laughs> You're, it's a C minus now for sure. So let me tell you about what Al did. That's my new name for him. So Al went to visit the cemetery at night, hoping to communicate with the dead. He was actually looking to investigate it to some degree, but he said that he became so overwhelmed with sadness and emotion that he ended up crying uncontrollably while he was there, unable to make any connection or able to explain his reaction, he left. And from what I read, he hasn't returned. So that's good. I mean, I know it doesn't give you anything juicy or whatever, but he noted it enough to be like, this is not me. I mean, maybe it was, maybe he just became overwhelmed with being there and thinking about the people's history. And he didn't expect to have those emotions. But I can tell you personally, I was investigating the Silver Queen in Virginia City, Nevada, and I was trying to speak with the spirit. And then just all of a sudden, I got really fucking emotional. And I'm an emotional person. So, you know, maybe not that odd with me, but I could tell you, I don't. Have you ever seen me cry at an investigation before? No. So so where the <laughs> no. fuck does that come from? No, exactly. And yeah. and I was slowly just becoming visibly upset. Like I tried watching the video because I record it myself because that's what we do is we document everything. It was hard to watch. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you blubbering? You uh-huh. know, but I felt really sad and stuff. I, I mean, it's not to the point that I would never investigate that location again. I yeah. am a nut job. And I would go back and want to see if it would happen again. But maybe it shook him as like, this is yeah. weird that it's physically affecting, emotionally affecting me like this. Yeah. Uh, and I would agree. Well, first of all, I agree with you. Every investigation that we've been to, I've never seen you bust out in tears. I mean, that, we've had some like equipment malfunctions too, which have, you've gotten like seriously irritated over, but you haven't been like, you know, starting to cry over it or anything. That's more of a me. I like go right to the tears kind of a thing, <laughs> if anything. This guy, to, more to his point, he did seem to be like kind of emotionally wrapped up in this. And, and it is a very sick and sad story. And, and if you are that involved in trying to connect with those people on that kind of a level, I think it's very easy to open yourself up to feeling that way. And being sad, sure, I'm sure he already was. I think he might have taken something on just as you had. Uh, in your experience there from the Silver Queen, something and he said it was an uncontrollable c- cry. He couldn't like back away and just be like, OK, think of something happy, happy thoughts. You know, he, it was just it had taken him over and, and wouldn't let go until like the next day. He was like a blubbering idiot, basically. 
Yeah, well, and mine didn't last that long either. You know, I kind of gathered myself and then exited the room and it was just like, that's weird. I'm also one that like, I say I'm really emotional, but I don't necessarily get emotional in front of people. I'm not comfortable doing that. So even my own family. So going back to my kids and everything like that, you know, you got to pull that shit together and we move on with our day. We got other things planned. So imagine for him it must have been something like what you had go on at edinburgh and you know it lingered and that i mean it scared you so totally when i read that and i i thought about it i was like wow i wonder if that was and even even going back to where the guy was in the bathroom and he said that the it started to get hot in there i was like get the fuck out of that bathroom (laughs) when it got hot at edinburgh i couldn't go anywhere so and maybe if I had gotten out quicker, I wouldn't have had that, you know, terrible reaction. And it stayed with me for a really long time. And, you know, maybe with this guy, it was the same way. It was just, it was more of a, I don't, I don't know. It, it's a sad experience. I don't know if he had taken on a soul that was sad that they couldn't do anything for anybody else or if they were sad because they lost someone. I mean, there's a lot of different people that are buried there too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I thought that was, that was the only thing that I could really dig up on the cemetery. But on the other hand, We still have central Hong Kong, which is where the Murray house originated. And even though I'm not able to really pull up anything additional going on from Stanley, I sure as fuck was able to find out a lot about the paranormal activity going on in central Hong Kong. (laughs) And you know how much I love my lists. So (laughs) I've compiled one for you. (laughs) Love it. This is a very brief rundown, which contains a variety of haunted locations, all from where the Murray House originated. First up is Blake Garden. In 1894, bubonic plague, which went on to kill thousands of people living in the colony, broke out and around what is now the hipster neighborhood of Po Hing Fong. The buildings where most of the people perished and were demolished is now Blake Garden. Hong Kong's first public park. This is what was built in its place. And people say they see children dressed in traditional Chinese clothing playing in the park. That's upsetting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. I don't want to see kids. But I mean, if they're playing, I mean, maybe it's just um, bittersweet. That's true. I like that. Happy somewhat. They're playing. So second on the list is Po Hing Fong. Po Hing Fong has experienced other disasters apart from the plague. The cul-de-sac, originally site of Dr. Sun Yat-sen's Center for Anti-King Revolutionaries, was the scene of a fatal accident in 1925 during a flash flood. On July 17th, just before 9 a.m., nearly 80 people were killed when the torrent of water days after heavy rain led to the collapse of a retaining wall on the corner of K9 Road and Ladder Street. Oh, fuck. Lots and lots of bad stuff going on in this area, right? So I would honestly, just after everything that I've read, you would think that the haunts would be not so benign. (laughs) Like, I would be pissed (laughs) off. It's like, everybody's dying here, guys. Yeah, but it's it's not like it's... Well, I mean, I don't know if you finished your list or not, but it's not right. from it's not from torture and murder and or it's like not that. yeah, it's not an evil doctor running around or anything like that. <laughs> it's people that were just in the well, I say the wrong place at the wrong time and that makes sense for the disaster that happened. You might think not for the plague, but I do. I mean, I think yeah. It's not like you necessarily go out and contaminate yourself purposely with the plague or whatever like that. Like, you know, you just happen to run into the wrong people or be around the wrong people. It just gets you. I mean, yeah, yeah, it just it just caught up to them. Right. Um, Yeah. So, no, that's not the last one on my list. I have I have plenty more depressing stories to go through. (laughs) (laughs) I was just meaning that it's tragedies that are going on. So these spirits are probably not necessarily so super pissy. Right. They're just they were taken kind of unexpectedly or, you know, not when it was necessarily supposed to be their time. Right. So they wouldn't be like demonic hauntings. If anything, yeah. they your spirits that didn't realize that they had been it killed. It caught or, them off guard. Right. Yeah. yeah. So these hauntings are probably just them trying to probably most likely trying to communicate with you. I'm like, hey, guys, what the fuck is going on? What are these things driving around? You know, what's happening? Where's my house? 
Why yeah. are you walking into my bathroom? You know, it's probably one of those kind of things. It probably would be an amazing place to investigate because of that kind of activity. Um, and like I said, these are all, these places that I'm going through on my list here are all in central Hong Kong and you can walk and hit every spot. Just, they're all in a row, all in a row. <laughs> so <laughs> third is, all right, guys, don't come at me. I'm, I'm probably not going to say this one right. Sai Ying Pun. We're going to try that. It's the Sai Ying Pun Community Complex. It is 126 years old. The building on High Street, the one that I just said, <laughs> is believed to be inhabited by ghosts. Originally a nurse's dormitory, it was occupied by the Japanese forces during the Second World War and then later became a mental hospital. The building was abandoned in the 1970s and remained empty for the next 20 years. In the 1990s, the government retained the original facade of the building, but redeveloped the rest, turning it into a community center. <laughs> Fun. During the 70s, when the building was abandoned, curious thrill seekers related tales of having seen headless people wandering around the corridors. Wait, why is that happening? <laughs> right. Why are they always headless in this area? I don't know if, if there's a connection there or not, but, and then they would say that they would see ghosts of previous mental patients, but I don't, I don't know how they were able to connect that. I don't know if that's just hearsay or, or, you know, spooky stories because if I don't, I didn't see where they were actually like, excuse me, sir, how did you get here? <laughs> Maybe they were in a hospital gown though. That's true. I mean, th that's a clear statement. I mean, some of my nineties do look like hospital gowns though. <laughs> I'm with you on that's that. My <laughs> but... I mean, I would assume the beheaded people are people that were yeah. executed by the Japanese when yeah. they were under occupation. And then the and then I guess they're seeing them in hospital gowns. Or they're just trying to throw that in that they're mental patients because right. they have a backstory, they right. have a history. That's so they're thinking. trying to say that must be where they come from, you know. Right. It True. could be anybody and anything, though. It really could be. But it seems like a really uh, – I've seen pictures of this place, and it's its also another amazing building. Uh, by the way, I just want to throw this in there. Just because I'm doing a little shorty on all of these places doesn't mean I'm not going to do a future episode on any of them. So if you <laughs> – if you think that this is all that I'm giving you, maybe one day in the future you might hear a little bit more because I just had to include them in the story because they were all along the same area right. from the, where this one building was that had to be exercised. And I thought that that was pretty impressive. This much shit was happening in that same area. So next is, this is number four. This one is Bridges Street, which intersects Xing Wong Street and Staunton Street. Remains the site of several notable buildings, including the YMCA. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sorry, I guess I'm just shocked they have a YMCA. <laughs> I know. <right? laughs> it was built in 1918. It's now listed as a grade one historic building. I guess they didn't take that one down brick by brick and move it somewhere else. The Japanese used the streets buildings as barracks during the war in 1945 when the occupying Japanese forces surrendered at the end of the war a large number of soldiers are believed to have committed suicide there mm, that's not good uh, energy nearby residents say they often see the shadows of soldiers at night and hear the sound of marching soldiers and even sobbing coming from the YMCA building of all places <laughs> so <laughs> I'm trying to think of how the song goes. Like, there's a. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to be happy and having a good time there, though. So, I mean, like, yes, that's disturbing. <laughs> you don't remember them saying, and you'll be crying at the Y. <laughs> Those marching soldiers will be sobbing at the YMCAA. No, I don't think it was in the song. No. <laughs> uh, the fifth location is Shek Tong Sui. The area of Shek Tong Sui in Saiwan on Hong Kong Island, was first settled in by the Hakka people in the 17th century. The name is derived from the old stone pond, or Shuktong, around what is now Hill Road. Granted, see, I'm giving you directions, too, just so you can make your own notes if you guys are already in Hong Kong and you're like, where the fuck are these places? I'm so drawing a map out right now. <laughs> no, I'm already sitting there thinking, you're saying that all these things are kind of in close in proximity and stuff. I'm like... I wonder if they have a walking ghost tour thing going over there. I 
wonder, or if they need one, that's what I'm system. saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to live abroad. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. And like I said, it sounds like a really cool place. I mean, now it does. Not so much then. No. Mm-mm. So granite miners moved to the area in about 1880 and in the early 1900s. Possession points brothels were moved here by the then governor, Matthew Nathan, two first names. The area flourished as the wealthy came to the area for entertainment and as the Cantonese opera houses and restaurants opened up. Yet the golden era of the district ended in 1935 when the government banned prostitution. However, this period in Shek Tong Tsui's history has inspired many feature films, including Stanley Kwan's 1988's Rogue. I I don't know. I just left it in there in case anyone was interested. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) A little historical fact there. There you go. (laughs) For you movie buffs, brothels were brought back to the area under Japanese occupation, which served only the Japanese occupiers. During this time, the Japanese military living in the area wreaked havoc in the neighborhood. Many civilians and prisoners were executed on the streets. They're pretty ruthless. Yeah, they were really, really, really ruthless. So it's not uncommon for residents of the neighborhood to report hearing the clanking of chains late at night. Many of the old style stores in the area with loft residents are said to be haunted with what they assume are the lost souls still occupying those places. I hate the clanking of chains. That's so. (laughs) Oh, I was sitting there saying that could be the brothels too, but whatever. (laughs) Oh, hi, hi. (laughs) If you're into that kind of thing. (laughs) All right, that's. We'll go with that. So number six is Ship Street's Namku Terrace. Now, this is a creepy little building. A two-story red brick house that sits on Ship Street (laughs) with a P, Ship Street. Another grade one historic building that had been erected in 1915 by the wealthy T.O. family, so two family of merchants from Shanghai. Tu Chun Man was the chief silk salesman and later assistant manager for Wing On Department Store and was also a member of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. He was forced to leave his home when Japanese forces occupied Hong Kong. This property was said to have been used as a military brothel, again, between 1941 and 1945, and Japanese soldiers were believed to have abused and tortured people there. After the war... The house continued to be used by the two family until 1988 when it was sold. It is currently owned by Hopewell Holdings. The sightings of headless spirits roaming the mansion have been reported. Yeah, I really feel like everything that involves the Japanese occupation has like a headless spirit there, man. I mean, obviously, well, not obviously, we don't know for sure, <laughs> but they they must have been beheading yeah. people. Yeah, they were doing some pretty, like you said, ruthless things. So most famously, a group of teenagers reported seeing an apparition there while spending the night in the abandoned mansion as a dare back in 2003. <laughs> you know, you, you see that on like uh, Instagram or Facebook, right? Where it's like, would you spend a night in yes. this mansion? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, were you about to say for a million dollars? I would have done it for free, bitch. I know. It's it's so funny when you see that. Or it's like, would you work in a haunted graveyard for, yes, I'll take less than what I'm paying to work in a haunted graveyard. Are you kidding? The perks there alone. I don't know about that. (laughs) Just the interactions, man. Got to be better than what I'm dealing with now. Boop, 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 boop. (laughs) So, yes, uh, on a dare, they stayed the night there. This is, oh. I, I, this one I want to find out more about. One girl claimed to have been possessed while another teenager was forced to seek psychiatric help because of what had happened to him there. Who who let these fucking children in this house in the no, first right? place? They could, yeah, right? Uh, you're They're right. dropping it's, some acid and seeing some <laughs> shit. It's probably. what's going on. It was 2003. So most likely they're teenagers. They found the abandoned place. They were smoking dope. Sure, sure, sure. That's Something. clear. Yeah. Or drinking. Okay. I got it. They knew the place was haunted. So already they're they're like on high alert. They're going to be looking for anything, something. But the fact that like one girl was said to have been possessed afterwards while one had to take his ass to see a psychiatrist afterwards. I'm like, I, I got to know more, guys. 
Yeah. That's, that's, that's just, that's just the itty bitty juicy tidbit. I hope I find out more and it's like, dare I say it, that Velisca ax murder guy, the, the guy that went to investigate what was his name, bud, buddy, buddy Lee. Um, remember he, uh, God, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, we had gone to Velisca Axe Murder House and uh, Johnny Hauser was like, yeah, well, you know, just don't do anything crazy like that guy that stabbed himself. Yeah. And when you heard his story, he's just like, it was the most oppressed feeling. He looks visibly fucked up from All right. for the right. rest of his life. Yeah. I just mean, I can't believe these, like, I don't know. I guess it's my mom ness going <laughs> like just showing all over the place because yeah. I have teenagers and all I want to do is ever never let them go anywhere. Yep. So the fact that you said teenagers stayed at a place, I'm like, back up. Hold on. <laughs> and then they end up oh, fucking possessed right. and having to seek, uh, you know, mental hospitals and stuff afterwards. I'm like, that's why you don't let your children go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's that's so true. I actually saw an episode of something, some show, some I don't remember. It's something paranormal. I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm not going to struggle with trying to remember the name. But there was a couple of kids that did something similar, but it was here in the U.S. They had been investigating this one, I think it was a school, like an abandoned school. And they were going pretty regularly. It was her and, and a, a good friend and maybe another buddy. And then all of a the sudden, they brought something like evil back home with them from their investigations. Like it was so messed up that now these kids were being attacked regularly at the house. So, yes, lock your children up. Keep them at home. <laughs> Don't let them go out there exploring the paranormal. <laughs> they or bring anything. back the bad shit. Or I don't know why. That's true. <laughs> so now I'm on to number seven, which is Star Street. This street is a popular location for foodies these days. But back in 1841, the colonial government designated the area as a site for a burial ground for non-Chinese residents. Although this idea was scrapped in 1889 in favor of using the land for residential buildings. It was. Like <laughs> I'm that. just wondering where did they put those nine? <laughs> where did they put I them? Know. In? Where did those people go? <laughs> or did they do a little bothies? <laughs> During the Battle of Hong Kong in 1941, a Japanese bomb fell into an air raid shelter located on the street, killing hundreds of people. In 1985, a number of Star Street residents reported seeing ghosts escaping from the place where the air raid shelter had stood on the same day and at the same time. Ooh. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I don't, I don't like how it happened or whatever, but we need to find out that exact moment and make sure that that's the time that we're in Hong Kong when we it, go. It does seem like something interesting to see. You know, you imagine like you turn your head. Oh, there's a ghost standing there. Oh, right. you're sitting in a chair and a ghost wanders across the doorway. You know, right. like, what the fuck was that? But I mean, the way that they're describing it is kind of like, We've said this in other podcast stories where people had seen visuals, reenactments of things yeah. that are going on. So you imagine you just all of a sudden see a bunch of ghosts. Yes. Exiting this one thing in a rush. In like, a rush. Yeah. That's wild. It was pretty wild. They had interviewed several uh, different residents that were on the street, but they all had the same story. Like they were all the, telling the exact same story. And these these were all people that weren't like... You know, hey, Mac, hey, Johnny B. You know, they weren't like tight people. They weren't like get on the phone. Discussion. They didn't know each other. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that was interesting. What I liked about that one, I really think it's Ghostbusters. I could totally be wrong, but there was a movie. I hope it's Ghostbusters. Maybe it was the second one. But it's like the Titanic rolls up and every ghost that had sank with the Titanic like gets off the ship. I think it was Cheech Marin, too. He's like, they're all like. <laughs> Hey, you know, we're finally here. And it's like all the ghosts, you know, then people are watching this ghost and these people walking off the ship and their right, mouths right, right. are dropping, you know. That's, that's gotta, kind of my... It's got to be Ghostbusters too, right? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I think it was Ghostbusters too. I can't remember for the life of it, but that's what it made me think of. It's definitely Ghostbusters. It's one or the other. Okay, good. Well, at least I got that part right. <laughs> it, and it, so it can't be the first one. It's got. I think it's the second one. I think it's the second one. If not, then this will just be another oops episode for me, you know. Whatever. <laughs> I'm on a roll. <laughs> No, we said both of them. It's one or two. One or, or two. There we go. That's what we're going to do from now on. Options. Just whatever. And finally, my eighth spot to check out. 
is Fenwick Street. In 1964, the luxurious cinema East Town Theater at the junction of Lockhart Road and Fenwick Street in Wan Chai opened its doors on the site of a demolished funeral parlor. The cinema was able to seat 1,300 people and had the best equipment in town. <laughs> Must have been a fancy theater. Bougie, yeah. However, it was closed after 10 years because of rumors that it was haunted. <laughs> That's why they closed it down. Wow. And then and then they demolished it to make things even better. They're Fuck, like, <laughs> it was super haunted. <laughs> right. This is interesting. The sales counter at the cinema noticed that more often than not, there were more admissions than the number of tickets sold. The management thought that maybe it was because of the use of counterfeit tickets. But after checking, they found that the numbers of stubs matched the actual tickets sold. One night, they decided to do a head count and saw mysterious shadows among the audience. And then they started getting stories about ghosts being seen in the toilets. <laughs> So what? that was too much for them. Yeah, seriously, they're in the bathroom again. So after that, the theater was closed. Do you think there's a bunch of ghosts in the sewer systems in China? That's just what's happening here. Why are they always in the fucking bathroom? I mean, this place, it was built on top of a demolished funeral parlor. So, I mean, think about it. A funeral parlor, you know, from the things that I've seen, you know, they have that one place it's usually down in the basement where right. they're like letting out all your bodily fluids and stuff so in essence it's possible that there was something that was coming up from from underneath i don't know i mean usually you don't want to think of funeral parlors being haunted because that's not like where the memories would have been that's not the place where you'd want to haunt like i mean unless you're like me you're like oh who else is in here i'm in a funeral parlor but you know generally speaking it's going to be the places that if you're just a ghost, it's going to be, you're going to be at the place that you love, you know, the place where you're yeah. trying to connect with your family. So I don't or know. The place you last were, you know, when you were alive and stuff like that. Not your, I mean, your body's pretty deceased by the time it's heading to the funeral parlor. However, shit, I wish I had the name, but just this week, I got a recommendation for a podcast that's all about like stories that happen at a funeral home. Wow, really? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there are haunted funeral homes out there because there's apparently a whole podcast about it. Wow. <laughs> and I don't have the name, but I'll try to have it for the next episodes or something. So I'm, I'm going to keep sidebarring here and talking about movies. But do you remember in Home Alone when, uh, what's his name? The uh, Polka King of the Midwest is in the back of the, the rental van and he's talking to... Macaulay Culkin's mom and he's like well except for that one time uh you know he got locked up at the funeral home <laughs> we remembered and and went back and got him after uh the next day or something like that but he'll be fine you know he sees a therapist or something <laughs> like that. I don't remember that line but I I mean I remember like the whole her in the vehicle with the uh, them She's talking about how horrible of a mom she is. She's like, can you believe it, though? And she's like, yeah, but have you ever, like, flown away and left your son at home? And he goes, no, <laughs> no. And she's like, yeah, I know. And he's like, there was that one time, though, that I left him at the funeral home. <laughs> and then he continues to give details. And she's just like, oh, my God. You're a monster. She doesn't say it, but the look in her eyes says everything. Yeah. <laughs> So Stanley, Hong Kong is now the peaceful area that I mentioned earlier in my story, the cute touristy spot where you can leave the hustle and bustle of the big city apparently just 20 or 25 minutes behind you, even though it is a very nice place to visit, shop, picnic, take long walks, and simply relax. You got to remember that this was such a devastating place at one time. Well, like I said, the cemetery is four minutes away from the Murray house and the prison is just a couple minutes beyond that all very near the St. Stephen's college massacre site. Central Hong Kong is the bustling big city, which still seems to have so many trapped spirits that have yet to move on for reasons we are at this point in time unsure of just because I didn't investigate any of those other stories. Uh, I said earlier that I really wished I had left this story alone when I originally saw it and that's because after delving deep into the story, I felt so defeated because I was unable to find out more about the Murray building and the Stanley area hauntings, which is pretty messed up if you think about it. 
I'm actually really, really glad that there are areas where such terrible tragedies have once occurred, and yet the spirits of those that endured the worst during those battles have actually moved on and may be able to rest in peace, I'm hoping. Uh, somehow those souls did not hold on to those atrocities and are now hopefully in a better place. Absolutely. So otherwise, I thought that the story was incredible. And like I said, I... I wanted to dig into it so much more. I think that uh, there was a lot that I, I, when I was Googling stuff and, and trying to find out more information, it's just not out there. It's not out there for me to find out anymore. And I don't know if some of it's so old because there were sites that I was clicking on where stuff had been removed. There was also a site that I went right to and it was all completely in a different language. And I don't know, this is just me and not being educated properly. I don't know if they speak Chinese in Hong Kong or if it's a different language, if it's Cantonese or Japanese. I know that there was a lot of different uh, ethnicities there. So I'm not really sure which language it would even be on the site or these sites that I was Googling and looking up and, and the words. I just don't recognize it. So I didn't attempt to, to translate. I, I just got my research from the sites that were in English so that I, I understood what I was telling you guys. So I apologize if there is more out there. That's probably wiser to not try to. I mean, there'd be a whole lot of oops corner. Okay. <laughs> if we make assumptions that we know what we're talking about True. a language we're not familiar with. Exactly. I don't want to do that. Well, I'm glad you did do this story because I was highly entertained. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds like really fucked up and dark. But I mean, I just love the history story of it all. And to hear the the little tidbits of what paranormal activity was going on and how they dealt with it. And now I want you to look into the sewers being haunted over there. Yeah, because right? I, I know. there's got to be a story down there. There's a lizard man or something going on. <laughs> He's been eating people. Illuminati, I'm sure. And yes, I have to do more research on this area because it seems like just because I found like this one street of haunting after haunting after haunting doesn't mean that there's not another street that doesn't have the same thing. Or maybe I should go back and, and you know, research some of these other stories. It's just very fascinating. There is a lot of history, deep, deep rooted history into these streets. I mean, like I said, it, some of this shit goes back to the bubonic plague type area. So yeah. It was interesting. I'm glad that I, I researched it, you know, and that I got to share it with everybody here on the podcast. So if you've had a paranormal experience, it doesn't have to have been in Hong Kong. Uh, any old paranormal experience will do. We'll take it from everywhere. <laughs> 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 Write to us at creatures of the night paranormal at gmail.com. Or if you're more into connecting via social media, then you can find us there too. Check us out on Facebook or Twitter under COTN Paranormal or on Instagram as COTN underscore paranormal. I'd also like to recommend that you hit us up on our website for a sweet ass t shirt because we like to make them. We like to read our podcasts and make t-shirts at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we like to have a thousand little projects going on all the time <laughs> because we're just creative people like that. So we like crafting and we like developing these, you know, cool ass spiritual products and then digging up these stories to tell you about and really just to entertain ourselves as well. So that, yeah. yeah. So you can go to our website, creatures of the night paranormal.com, and we have our past investigations on there. We have our blog on there. We have products that you can buy, spiritual products like, you know, bath bombs or sprays or oils that you can buy to help protect yourself if you're a paranormal investigator or if you're experiencing something in your home that you'd like to protect yourself from. Mm -hmm. And then we also have t-shirts that say creatures of the night podcast so you can join our kind of uh, cult, <laughs> our I don't cult. Know, army <laughs> whatever we are you can be a part of this group by listening by subscribing by buying a t-shirt and we can all be united like that i don't know and you can also leave comments on blogs and on our cases there's a place to comment if you want to leave us your opinion or your experience of any place that we might have explored in the past and yes. maybe you haven't done a podcast on just yet. If you want right. to share, help make those stories a little juicier because it will eventually do every location that we've been to. So oh, if yeah. you've been there and you want to share, then take a look at our creatures in the night paranormal dot com and then you can leave comments on the investigations and that'll help build to our story. 
<laughs> you can also go and find all of our podcasts on YouTube. It's uh, COTN Paranormal or any place you find our podcasts, but like and subscribe and share. And I believe on any of those sources, you can comment as well. But yeah, that's all that I had. Thank you. And uh, bye bye. Bye. You know what we need? I get it. We've got to have a fucking sign off. So like my favorite murder has like a cat meowing or they're like SSDGM. What is it? Stay sexy and don't get murdered. We need a sign off. That's how we we end it. We got to figure I that know. out. When we first started it, I thought, let's try to come up with that. Well, we're our dumb drunk asses. We're always yelling things like pineapple out. And, uh, <laughs> I know. I'm and I love that. Which, I mean, I still like pineapple out. But uh, I don't think that everyone will get that. It's not <laughs> as maybe catchy because you have to know right. what that's all about. And then one time I tried, like... I think I yelled out like sweet dreams, but that's just dumb because I listen to most of my podcasts during the day. Yeah, I know. (laughs) So I'm, I'm so on with saying like, hello, how are you doing? Thanks for listening to today. And then I'm like, oh, and my, my brain goes, oh, they might not be listening to this today. Maybe it's tonight. And then I'm like, wait a fuck. What does it fucking matter when they're listening? Who gives a shit? It doesn't matter. Why am I like, my brain is like, oh, but you also have to include, but, 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 and then my mouth just like, it's diarrhea. All well, over. you would have a shit ton of oops corner if I would allow you to include shit like that. <laughs> Let me apologize. You probably didn't listen to it at this time of day. <laughs> fuck that. They get it. It's okay. But yeah, sign off. I don't know. I mean, like, can people help us out with that? Can they maybe listen to this episode? And then when we post it on social media, you just tell us what we're supposed to be saying. (laughs) Sign off. And we'll try a bunch of different ones out. I mean, I don't want to say like happy hunting or I don't know. That just seems so cheesy. You see that on like all of the signs at Michael's for like, it's got like a picture of a ghost and it's like, happy hunting. (laughs) I can get one that could be our sign. (laughs) I mean, and I get it. Like I, I love paranormal investigating. So it is happy hunting and we're so happy to do it. But I don't want to say that because it sounds like something I don't know my grandma would say. How about this? contest time how about if someone helps out and comes up with a way for us to end this shit they get a maybe a t-shirt or something cool a f- oh. yeah. yeah yeah a free t-shirt or something from our shop probably a yeah. t-shirt though <laughs> just yeah, right from a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying i think that'd be good there you go help us out how do we wrap this shit up what do you right. say at the end of your night of investigating <laughs> I love you. Good night. (laughs) (laughs) You probably, if you're like us, you say, uh, and don't follow us home, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) We end our podcast. Don't follow us home. home. Peace out. (laughs) Follow, subscribe, rate and review, but don't follow us home. Right. So we're just doing this off the fly of our asses. So, but, uh, sure. If you guys have some suggestions, right, and you want to get in on this free T-shirt deal, then write to us at any of the places that we told you about already. I'm not going to repeat it because I've already closed my my page. It's gone. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> so you just hit that back, back 30 seconds like a couple of times and get back to all of those web pages that we told you about. And write to us with your suggestion on how we end this shit, wrap that shit up, like Wendy said, and get you a free T-shirt, right? Yeah. And if you don't have any suggestions and you think, no, the way y'all do it is fine, all awkward and weird and just yelling <laughs> stuff out to each other, then yeah, let us know that too. Being like, nah, it's you guys are good. Just say, it's fine. I liked y'all mixing it up. <laughs> all right. Hey, and we got animals too. We got a whole bunch of animals between the two of us. We could make one of them meow or bark or I got some kids that can make can noises. Make soft, <laughs> weird noises, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be loud, weird noises probably from mine, but my oldest can make a raptor noise. No, like a pterodactyl noise. Sorry. Anyways, yeah, help us out. So I got to say bye again. I said bye already. (laughs) Goodbye. Get out of here. (laughs) 